splendid Sabbath uh, to us all. Amen. I'm quite delighted uh, to be in your midst. Also quite happy that a lot of us could make it. When I was told that I'm preaching it around nine, I was like, would the church really be full? But I thank God that indeed we almost up to the brim. Amen. Um, also, I'd like to thank uh, Pastor Hall uh, for a quite um, uh, giving a good introduction and even urging the church uh, to heed more to the message. I'd also like to thank Dr. Laguno for being in our midst. I mean, we have worked a lot in this field and have been uh, spearheading a lot of this work even in the region and you are continuing to do so. May God continually to bless your ministry. And also to thank the doctors, I mean, Dr. Candice, uh, for the invitation. Amen. So the title of our sermon today, this morning, is entitled, Is There No Bound in Gilead? Is There No Bound in Gilead? Let us pray. Mighty Father, we come at your throne of grace. Who am I? Just a mere mortal man. A vessel in need to be filled by your Holy Spirit. A vessel that is desiring that you speak through me. Because you are the only one who can touch the hearts of men. Lord, be with us today. Allow us to see great principles that we can apply in our lives from a holy word. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. The title that I have said emanates from a verse that we find in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 8, verse 22. Jeremiah, chapter 8, verse 22. So this comes from a verse which is loaded with questions. So Jeremiah says in, verse, in chapter 8, verse 22, Is there no bound in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has not the health of the daughter of my people been restored? So Jeremiah is asking these questions. But if you realize, this is the last verse of the chapter uh, 8. And Jeremiah does not go ahead even to, to respond to them. So in essence, we can take them as rhetorical questions. Questions just, just lead you to ponder more but questions that can give you much insight if you realize the meaning of them. So there are two quick things that come to mind here. It is the context of the speaker here who is Jeremiah. Why is he asking those questions? But there's also the substance of the question. The substance, one of them is bound in Gilead. The other substance speaks to the physician. But let's just start with the context of the speaker himself. Who was Jeremiah? So we know that Jeremiah was probably born or was born around the time of Josiah. If we go to Jeremiah chapter 1, we get a glimpse of who he was and how God called him to ministry. But we realize that he is a son of a priest. And when he is a, because he's a son of a priest, but he later on, uh, the whole of his ministry is that one of a prophet. So in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the 11th year of King Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem to captivity in the fifth month. You see, so the whole book of Jeremiah has been summarized in these three verses. Because we are being told here that he started to receive these visions and some historians say that when he received this message, he was around the ages of 25. So up to the time that the Israelites are taken into captivity and he continues again to prophesy to them, his whole ministry was actually for 40 years. So even unto the age of 65, he was still expounding and 
actually aging the people because of the message that he was receiving from God. So the next question is, what was his message? So Jeremiah had a, a not so good message. So Jeremiah was telling them that there's going to come a northern army. There's going to come a kingdom from the north. And if we do not repent, actually this kingdom is going to capture us. So and when he mentioned to them, side and even the direction of the north, it quickly depictified that these were the Babylonians that were going to come and capture the children of Israel. So at least he was saying that we want to take note that uh, there were many people who were so much concerned with this message because it did not make sense during that time. Why it did not make sense? It was because uh, the Babylonians were not the superpower then. Egypt was actually the superpower. So when people would hear this message, that people are going to come from the north, they would really question to themselves, is this really a message from the Lord? So he started preaching, just saying that they will come from the north. But as we get deep into the Bible, you'd realize that the Babylonians actually came and got closer to the city of, of Jerusalem. And as they got closer to the city of Jerusalem, uh, the message then came through uh, the same prophet that these Israelites had to submit themselves to the Babylonians. And this was now, again, not so, a nice message to the people. Number one, how does God give message to a prophet of God that we should go to that foreign nation and submit ourselves to them. Why would God, wouldn't God actually give us a message that the enemy has come against us? He will give us power now to go and fight it. So all these messages of Jeremiah were not so palatable to the people. And as the book ends, he even has another one where he is now, it's now the lamentations of what? Of Jeremiah. People did not heed his message. A question comes to mind, are we not also in the same predicament, maybe as the people of Israel, that there's a message that has come to the church, but as we look at that message and look at what is in the world, this message seems not so to be a message from the Lord. Hello? Maybe we might believe at certain times that this is God's message, but the practice of that message is, is just not so palatable to us. Hello? Maybe it's, it's so restrictive. Uh, can God create everything? And, and didn't God... Actually, we, we have portions of Scripture that we can go to and even try to say this message is not relevant. But maybe let, let's ignore the context of the prophet. Let's come to the substance that he's talking about, Baum. So you'd realize that uh, Baum, as the text is saying, is saying, is there no Baum in Gilead? So the Baum was actually a unique, I mean, a therapeutic uh, plant that was found only, it actually was indigenous in the area of Gilead. And with, uh, as you even are aware, this is an area in which the Israelites would, were living in. So this was sort of like th their heritage, hello? It was something that they were so much proud about. And it had so much therapeutic benefits to the point that, I mean, even when the queen of Sheba was visiting Solomon, one of the gifts that she had was even balm. It was so nice to the point that when, uh, you know, Joseph was in Egypt and his brothers and fathers were left there, when they wanted to go and see Joseph, uh, whom they did not know was Joseph, hello, they even took balm to go to give him. Perchance he might give us a good word, reception. So the therapeutic benefits were, were, were so much to the point that even Jeremiah himself uh, did not that, I mean, you can use other things, but if you are not using the balm from Gilead, you will not be healed. Maybe you might say these are the words of the preacher. Let's turn to Jeremiah 46, verse 11. Jeremiah is saying, go up to Gilead and take balm, O virgin daughter of Egypt. In vain you have used many medicines. There is no healing for you. 
So we, with these two contexts married together, a preacher who is a prophet who has a message that is not palatable to the people, and he is now asking questions about something that everyone in Israel is so much convinced about. And he's asking this at the backdrop that I'm telling you that the king of the north is coming, but you are not agreeing to that. I'm telling you that we are all going to be captured if we do not repent, but you still are not even agreeing to that. But my question is, this is Jeremiah asking this question, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? So in this context, Jeremiah is just saying, has the Israelites, have the Israelites been bewitched? What has happened to them? They should be the ones who are at the forefront of holding on to this message. But the reality was they were not. So with this context and with what we are hearing, Jeremiah asking and saying, I mean, someone is asking, what is, of re- what is that of relevance to us? I mean, we are talking about Balm of Gilead, talking about Jeremiah. I mean, it's a health day today. What is that of relevance to us? So we are actually in a scenario church. I mean, I I wish if I could create a face that is so pale, hmm? such that you could quickly believe the seriosity of this issue. But no, back then in 2005, the World Health Organization sent out uh, sort of promotional materials. And the world body was very much concerned that there's certain crop of diseases that are going to increase in countries, in low middle income countries, such as our own in South Africa and others. But their major concern was these countries have been so much used to infectious diseases. Hello? These are diseases that if I have, I can pass on to the other. Like right now, we are in a time where there's a cold. If someone is sneezing and is close to you, we know you also going to sneeze uh, very soon. Hello? Because it's highly contagious. So the whole body of the whole body of health world was worried that these these are increasing, and the hospital or the health infrastructure has not been developed to actually to counteract this surge or this increase in these diseases. So without such an worry, so they tried to convince the ministers, tried to even make everyone aware about that. So they sent out uh, a series which was entitled Preventing Non-Communicable Diseases, A Vital Investment. So they got much traction. Most health ministers and governments even went and acknowledged this this, um, uh, directive that the World Health Body was actually taking on because there was evidence that was presented to them. But then it was in 2005, and they were making projections that these diseases will actually be at very high uh, levels. But lo and behold, we are now in 2019, and what they started seeing in 2005 is now even at very unprecedented levels. For instance, it is estimated now, these are the new projections, that by 2030, 80% 80% of people who will be overweight or obese will be coming from low middle income countries. And 77% of these low middle income countries are actually the ones in Africa. But this is just a projection which has already been exceeded. Because according to our understanding, we know in South Africa that 70% of the women are actually overweight and obese as we speak right now. So I work at um, Baraguana Hospital. Uh, So I have decided, actually my career trajectory is to be immense myself totally in research. So that's what I'm actually working on, researching and actually meeting people physically to try to understand how their health is going on. And I remember as we were saying, we started this study. So this is a 12, 12,000 participants that we recruited in this study. And they've been recruited in East, West, and even South Africa. And South Africa comprises about 50% of the participants in this study. So as we're giving feedback of the results that we had seen over the five years that we've been looking at these people, we realized that overweight and obesity, particularly in the women in Soweto, was actually 90%. 
So here is the national statistic saying we are at 70%. But as we zone down into certain areas, we realize we are actually at 90%. There are diseases such as cancer. There are diseases such as heart disease, diabetes. These used to be called diseases of the West. Mm, not a good term, is it? They used to be called diseases of the rich people. But that's no longer the case. Even poor people, even people living in Africa are now suffering from these diseases. But maybe it's not an issue. I mean, you know, even if someone has high, high blood pressure, you know, they even fold themselves and say, ah, I just have a high blood pressure. Or they can say in their vernacular, ah, e high blood, I have e high blood. Eh? Or if someone who has uh, diabetes, I mean, they, yes, I mean, when it has started and there are no complications, to them it's not really a health threat. Hello. You can even see someone saying, ah, I actually have e sugar. You know, I, I have just trying to say I have uh, look, blood sugar, high blood sugar. So even though these diseases, to some of us, we are, we, are, we are not so much afraid about them. Hello. Not as much as we were when HIV got onto the radar. I mean, people were so much afraid that we even were preaching about stigma, eh? uh, that we need not to, you know, uh, expose people to other psychological insults by branding them or pointing fingers at them. So with this in mind, I mean, we, we're afraid of, uh, of AIDS like that. But as we now know, there's no even a challenge with regards to HIV and AIDS. Hello? Right now in South Africa, people are talking of a functional cure. So functional in courts, implying that there's a child who was born by a mother who was HIV positive. Then this child was placed on ARVs early enough. And with time, they were checking her bloods just to check, are we still detecting the virus? They could not detect the virus, and the child, for some time, stopped treatment. Then they followed that child again, tried to measure the, the virus. They could not even detect it. So then they are now saying, is this not a functional cure? I mean, the child has been in remission for quite a long time. So it seems we are almost getting closer to death. But in essence, as we are gaining ground and traction with this disease that can be passed on one to another, we are really losing the battle when it comes to non-communicable disease. I mean, this thing has even gone closer to home that even if I was going to ask you hands, to raise your hands, if in your family you have lost someone to cancer, we can see many hands actually coming up. So the question that comes, is there no balm in Gilead? I mean, cancer is so ravaging to the point that even the treatment itself, it's, it's what is there, but the treatment can even causes other or further complications. Recently, it hit very closer to home, and I remember a friend of mine calling me on the phone, and he says, are you at Barra? Then I said, yes, I am at Barra. Then my friend drops, drives in and he says, let's meet at the entrance. I come close to the entrance and I see the grandmother is actually in the wheelchair. So you could just see by looking at her that things were not really well. And the guy said, let's, let's, let's rush quickly and, and talk to this oncologist. I mean, maybe she might be admitted here. Yeah, maybe she'll get a better treatment. And as we wheeled her in, close to those oncologists, they asked for her files, and as they were opening her files, they got to a file where there was an X-ray, and as they were looking at that X-ray, a question came, this X-ray was taken two years ago. Why are you coming with an X-ray that is two years old? So we looked at each other, then my friend said, no, let me tell them the truth. So the guy starts to tell the doctors the truth, and he says, our grandmother first came, the doctors looked at her, they saw a, some cancer tumors in the brain, which you are seeing, but because of religious beliefs, she felt that if she's going to be admitted, she might actually die. So she opted to go out of the hospital, not to proceed with the treatment, but to spend more time in prayer with relatives and friends. But right now, the condition has deteriorated. 
we are actually now coming that if you, you might help us. Then the doctor is adamant, we cannot use an x-ray that is two years old. We should go back, they're staying in Feringache, go back there, get a latest x-ray. Then we can now start to look into her. Then while she was hearing these words, my friend was so much agitated. I mean, we are here where the specialists are. Why should we go back? So he's adamant and he's trying to say, can't you just see here? Can't you? And he's, you know, he's trying to convince these doctors, take my grandmother in. But lo and behold, sometimes, maybe I don't know, I would want, don't want to judge severely the oncologist, but she just threw in some frightening words. Then she said, okay, fair and fine. The X-ray was taken two years ago. They was only seeing tumors in the brain. But as we read in the other files, they're even suspecting that maybe there might be tumors in the what? In the breast. So what this means is this cancer might have started from the breast actually and it migrated to the what? To the brain. So at this stage, this cancer might have actually spread all over. And to me, I would like to ask your okay, opinion, does it make sense for us to operate here in the brain, remove a tumor in the brain, and even allow her to have further complications in the state that she is? Someone whom we know might not even live two months or more. This is an oncology saying these words. And there we are holding our grandmother. I'm actually holding the wheelchair. And she's saying this woman might not even have what two months. You know, I, it, me as a friend, I was quite heartbroken, but I understood that she is actually telling the what the truth from her prognosis. Hello, this is what she is seeing, and this is what she is seeing is the highly likable thing that is going to happen. And with those words, I mean, it was just a final blow. Uh, my friend ruled it out, and she she went back home. They staged the cancer. Indeed, it was actually stage four cancer. And with that, but one thing that is amazing, in the question of Jeremiah, it is saying, is there no physician there? Today, she's still alive. We do not know how. Implying that even physicians might see other things. There's a physician beyond our physician. Hello, Chet. There's a great physician who is God himself. But even though she is alive, the cancer is still there. So in reiterating and asking this question, that a message from a prophet is not regarded, then because it is not regarded, what God is saying through this prophet ultimately comes to pass. What am I trying to emphasize here, church? We have a powerful health message. But our problem as a church, we are debating its authenticity. But while we are struggling to debate its authenticity, we are actually in the times where heathens are validating our health message. Hello. I mean, those who follow health issues in 2015, the WHO, Cancer Organization, sent out their position statement and saying meat causes cancer. This is the World Health Body saying meat causes cancer. But back then when Ellen White was writing about meat and cancer, in her quotation she speaks about germs. Hello? But people who are medically educated who say how can germs cause cancer? Huh? But in, she was not wrong in linking meat and what? And cancer. Because now that is what we are seeing today. I mean, Adventists are the group of people that have been studied for long periods of what? Of time. And much research is coming out just in support of our health message. But if we ask the percentage of people who are following this message, we will really be shocked. I remember we did a small survey when I was in Zimbabwe and we realized that only 6% were following this message. If you come to the health study, Adventist health study, amongst black Africans, the percentage is quite high. 
around about 19%. But I wouldn't uh, put anything or higher expectations for us in South Africa. How many are really following this message? So the question still comes again, is there a bomb in Gilead? My answer is quite clear. There is a bomb in Gilead. The health message is our bomb. And the context where it's saying in Gilead, it actually indicates that Adventists have a message that is of much benefit to the world. If we read in Testimonies, uh, volume 9, page 158, Ellen White says, Seventh-day Adventists are handling momentous truths. More than 40 years ago, the Lord gave us special light on health reform. But how are we working in that light? On the subject of temperance, we should be in advance of all other people. She even goes to say health is a treasure. Of all temporal position, possessions, it is the most precious. Wealth, learning, and honor are dearly purchased at the loss of the vigor of health. None of these can secure happiness if health is lacking. So with the story that I narrated of my friend, I mean, it doesn't matter how much successful you're doing, how much your career is doing. Just imagine every day living with someone who is dying slowly. Hello. Just, just imagine that trauma. Hmm? Every day you, you, you even wake up in the night, is she still alive? Just imagine that emotional trauma. And let's say perchance that she succumbs to that sickness. Will you come here and say, Jesus saves? Hello? Will you really sing it with meaning? That really Jesus saves. Even when we come at that funeral as church members, glad in suits, sitting there, will you not think that really Jesus has passed me by? Really the Lord has forgotten me. I mean, look at these people when they're, some even lose hair. A lot of them lose weight. And while it's all those processes are happening, the great question is, is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? It is my prayer, church, that we take heed to this message. There's even massive research that is actually showing that people who adopted this plant-based diet, even while at least they were on their, their cancer patients, much improvements were seen. But my question is, as we are seated here, just like as Jeremiah was preaching, the king of the north is what is coming. Who knows? Maybe there's a big ailment that is about to hit you. Hello? Do you know these diseases like diabetes, hypertension, and cancer, they don't just start imminently. They take time. But my question is, before the king of the north comes, before that sickness comes close to you, remember, there is a bomb in Gilead. May God give us that courage that irregardless, it does not make sense. It might not make sense to us now. The Bible says, test and see that the Lord is good. Spiritual things are spiritually descended. They are not logical, but one thing is clear. When you start to practice them, benefits will come to you. How many today are in need of such a prayer? That, Lord, I don't want, uh, if, if, if perchance I'm getting close to there, because when this message was coming, really, the King of North was coming. I don't think it's by coincidence for us to hear such a message. God wants to prevent a certain illness, maybe, from getting close to us. But how many are saying, Lord, do not allow me to be deceived. Lord, uh, enlighten me, so that if there are any health habits that I should change, I can change them and live healthy and happily. It's possible there are people who are living up to 112 years. And they don't even have a single diabetes or cancer. Adventists are, are even called a, a blue zone, an area where people live up to hundreds. But amongst those blue zones, I've never seen anyone from Africa. May we rise 
as we seek the Lord in prayer. That, Lord, you have given us this message, not that it should speak to us when we are sick and very sick, but that it should be a tool or a vehicle of bringing health to us. And when it has brought health to us, that it even helps us to spread to many. I'm going to ask Pastor Hall to come as he commits us to the Lord, that God helps us. We have heard this message many times. Hello. Actually, when people meet you, they think every Adventist does not eat meat. Hello. They think every Adventist follows this message. But we don't want to be like the Israelites. Who were they in Babylon? They sing the song by the rivers of Babylon. We remembered what? Zion. They kept us, asked for us a song. Just imagine in a hospital and you now a doctor is saying, take this diet. Mm. I challenge you, church. Let's come in the afternoon and hear more and learn more. Commit to us to the Lord. Gracious Father, wonderful Savior, we thank you, Lord, that there is an answer to our situation. We are grateful, Lord, that we know that our well-being, our health, our future is dependent upon you. We're grateful, Lord, that you have given us all the wealth of knowledge and health to live long. And as the message is has come to us this morning oh lord we need to be able to change our thinking we need to look to you from whence cometh our help and our strength we have no doubt lord our help our strength cometh from the lord so i pray lord for this church i pray for each one of us your children beloved children children from whom for whom you laid down your life i pray father that we may take this message seriously that we make amends that we change our lives that we change our uh, our health styles help us lord to trust and to obey and to follow your bidding we pray gratefully and cognizantly in Jesus' name. Amen.